everybody, and welcome to episode number nine of our series, Growing in God. We made it three weeks, and so I really appreciate those of you who have seen all or at least most of these videos as we're going through 1 Timothy. So let me go ahead and get the scripture up on screen here, and we'll pray, and we'll get started. So God willing, we're going to finish out 1 Timothy today, and we got a good chunk of the way through chapter 6 last time. And then we'll finish it up and do a brief review if we have a little bit of time left over. And then uh, we'll move on to something different for the next time. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll get into the word of God. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, and that you do give us your word. And that we're able to see exactly how you feel about different things. Even though Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy in Ephesus, uh, we understand that it's your Holy Spirit that's guiding Paul's hand to write down these words. And so we read them not only as Paul wrote them to Timothy, but also as you writing them to us even today, Lord. So many of the principles that we've read throughout the study of 1 Timothy and will continue to read today have such a big impact in our lives today. And so I just pray, God, you would help us to focus on the truth of your word. It's so busy, uh, especially those of us that have kids or have other things. You're trying to work from home. And there's a lot of things going on, Lord. But again, I just pray that you would use this time to draw people closer to you in an, in an intimate way, Lord. We have corporate worship to be able to grow together, but we have individual worship so that we can walk side by side with you, Lord, to have this godly kind of life that we've been talking about all throughout this book, Lord. So I pray that you would continue to work in everybody's hearts, mine included, Lord, so that we can just know more about you, God, and be more passionate about who you are so that we can love you appropriately and biblically, Lord. So God, I just ask you would bless this time today and let everything that we say and do bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, last time we finished on uh, verse 10 of chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, and Paul went through this kind of long explanation about uh, people who are not focused on God, uh, not being content in God, and being uh, tempted and trapped by money. And so that kind of closed out in verse 10. So in verse 11, he's going to redirect his conversation to say, hey, Timothy, all, all those things that these people are doing are bad, and this is, this is what's wrong with them, and this is why they have this problem. And now he'll turn his attention back to Timothy um, to focus on our individual walk with God. You know, it's one thing as a Christian to um, say that, hey, you should avoid these certain things, or watch out for these things, or don't do this, or don't do that. And, and that's really valuable. But I think what takes precedence and supersedes all those things is knowing and loving God biblically. If you're living rightly before God, you're automatically not going to be doing a lot of things that we talked about in the first part of verse 6, uh, in chapter 1 when people were shipwrecked, and chapter 3 when, when it's talking about what makes a good leader to not do the opposite of those things. And so we, we have to understand that when we're living for God, that's just automatically going to take care of so many issues. doesn't mean that life's perfect doesn't mean that you won't have any problems, but when we, when we live for God and are very intentional about doing that, um, that automatically takes us out of some of these things that, that Paul was warning Timothy against for his congregation in Ephesus. So verse 11 says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So again, understanding that, that you are a man or a woman of God if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and that you belong to him, and that you were bought with a price, that he's given you the right to be called a son or a daughter of the Most High. And so people that are um, identifying themselves with God, your identity is in Christ. Um, the, the epistle, uh, the, the book of Ephesians is, is really awesome to talk about our identity in Christ. And so he's reminding Timothy of, of being um, property of God. And when you were a little kid, especially, especially guys, uh, you would like scratch your name in something, or if you have something expensive that you loan out to other people, you usually uh, etch your name into it to know that it that belongs to you. Um, and, that, and that's what God has done for, for you and me. When we've given our life to him, that, that, we're, that we belong to him, and that we're supposed to live our lives in line with him. So he says, hey, Timothy, remember, you belong to God. Flee from all this, all this junk we talked about in the first part of six. And he says, and pursue a couple of things that we'll define here, righteousness, and we always say that that's right standing with God, being, being right before the Lord, but not having any um, overt or secret sins before the Lord, but being able to, to stand up and say, you know, search my heart, oh God, and see if there's any sinful way within me, just, just being open and honest with him. Uh, living this godly life that we talked about in, in verse six, and if you missed the last video, really encourage you to go back and read, uh, watch or read all of those um, on your own time about living a godly life, about having faith that we're believing God based on what he said. 
Uh, you know, for, for some people, it's really hard to say, how, how can I take open this really old book and then do what it says? Can I really believe that that's what God has communicated to the world? And, and you have to have faith to be able to do that. You have to believe that God is who he says he is in his word. Um, to have love, and obviously we're, we're not doing, we're not living the Christian life and, and doing Christian things based on um, our effort or to, to get some kind of special reward or anything, but just out of the love, first and foremost, that God has shown us, and then the love that we're supposed to show with other people. Um, endurance that we talked about a lot throughout this book, uh, just, just sticking with God. You know, even when things get tough and when, when, whether things are good or things are bad, like really sticking with God and, and saying that you choose to live your life according to, to his word. And then the last one I want to talk about for a second, uh, gentleness. You know, this gets overlooked a lot in, in Christianity today. And, and one of the things that can happen to us as we try to live for the Lord is we're focused so hard on being, being in right standing with God and, and being in line with him and, and not straying off. Um, whether it's money or other things that we've talked about previously and, and living a godly life and really trusting God and, and loving, uh, loving other people, even when they're kind of unlovable, um, just doing it based on what God has shown us and, and sticking through things and enduring through problems. Sometimes we lose our gentleness, guys. Uh, we're, we're so focused and we're trying so hard to live for the Lord that when we see somebody else who may not have the same dedication, may not have the same fervor that you have, um, sometimes it's very easy to to be harsh with that person, you know, to kind of speak to them like, hey, what's wrong with you? Like, get your life together. Like, you know better. Come on. And there are definitely times uh, when when the Lord himself will, will speak to you in that manner or God will, will call someone around you to speak to you in that manner. Um, but that shouldn't be our that should be more the exception rather than the rule and um, that we're 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 treated with a gentle spirit by God and we should have gentleness toward other people. Um, if you see somebody who's out of line, don't say, well, look, I'm doing all this stuff and why can't you do all these things? Um, but really restoring them in, in gentleness, right? And, and, and really supporting them and, and helping them out and not being needlessly harsh on people. Now, if you've been gentle several times and they haven't got the message, sometimes you have to be a little more forceful, uh, but God will lead you in that. Okay, so don't default to being harsh, default to being gentle, okay? Uh, and I got to remind myself of that. Any of you who have, who have young kids, uh, you have to remind yourself of that all the time. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Um, and so Paul is telling Timothy, man, you, you, it's, it's a fight. Like you really got to stick it out with endurance, you know, and, and not take this thing lightly. Uh, Paul would say in, in elsewhere in the New Testament that he has fought the good fight, that he's getting ready to pass on. And so he's telling Timothy, man, take this serious and, and fight it out. Again, don't, don't avoid being gentle, but, but take it seriously. And you may be watching this video and, and maybe you haven't really taken your relationship with Christ very serious before the pandemic or before the study, before, you know, God spoke to you, but we're taking it serious because it's, it's reality. You know, the, the fact of the enemy is trying to draw you away from the things of God with so many things that there's some days where it's literally a fight, um, either, either around you physically, or even just in your mind, uh, where you're having this fight to be able to do what your faith is telling you needs to be done, what the Bible is telling you needs to be done. He also encourages Timothy by saying, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And so we know that for those of us who have put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ as, as our Lord and Savior, the only way to be saved, that you have eternal life you know, once, once you pass away or the second coming of Christ, uh, but also uh, right here and right now, that you have, you have abundant life, that you have eternal life now that you need to take hold of and, and live that out. And, and I think anybody who maybe was not living for the Lord for a while and then got serious with God and started to fight the good fight of faith, and you realize how much better your life is when you do it God's way. Again, not perfect. Not to mean that it's not everything is, is rainbows and puppy dogs, like we like to say, that there's problems, and that's why you got to fight, right? Uh, but really to take hold of that, because that kind of life, that kind of godly life, uh, go back up to verse 6, um, that, that godly life with contentment is great gain. That's, that's what we're called to. We're called to really live for the Lord. Um, and then he even goes on to say, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Um, so in that day, just like today, you know, when people decide to, to give their life to Jesus Christ, we have them, you know, come to the front to make that public profession if, if they're willing to do that. Um, and, and so Timothy very much had done that, not only to be a, a pastor in Ephesus, but also just, just to be a Christian. You know, um, every, every person who's in a position of ministry is first and foremost a child of God, a Christian, and then they may also have a leadership responsibility like we talked about in chapter three on top of that. He goes on in verse 13 to say, 
in the sight of God who gives life to everything and in Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. And so Paul, Paul is kind of zooming out um, to make sure that Timothy understands the gravity of the life that he's going to be living as he leaves the church in Ephesus. He's saying, hey, fight, fight the good fight of faith and hold on to eternal life. Just like whenever you said that you were giving your life over to Christ, essentially in, in verse 12. So he says, in the sight of God, so almost like kind of, kind of making a, a ceremony uh, that even though he's just writing him a letter, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate uh, made the good confession. So the whole uh, leading up to Resurrection Sunday and, and the, the, the story of, of how everything is, is going toward Good Friday and all these things um, that, that Jesus tells Pontius Pilate makes his good confession before him. Paul says, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, hey, when you fight this good fight of faith, when you take hold of this eternal life, he's saying in the sight of God, because what, whether you think about it or not, you are always in the sight of God. And he is omnipresent, that he is everywhere all the time, that he's omniscient, that he knows everything. And so there is nothing that you do in your life. And there's nothing that I do in my life that is separate or outside the, the purview or the understanding of God. So really every single moment that you live your life, you are under the, the, the microscope of God, that he's, he's watching you. And so if you're living wrongly, that's a terrifying thought, right? Like God sees everything I do. Yeah. But also um, that's a very reassuring thought that if you're living rightly before God to say like, man, God sees everything that I'm doing and he knows when things are hard and he knows when I have to verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. And so God knows and he sees me. And so when I pray to him, I know that, that he knows my situation. And so how, how you respond to the fact that God sees you all the time, whatever your, your initial feeling is to that, uh, maybe some, uh, maybe a pretty big indication for how you're living your life right now. So the same, something to pray about, right? And so he's saying, in the sight of God who gives everything the life in Christ Jesus, um, and references when he talks to Pontius Pilate, verse 14, to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is essentially saying in verses 12 through 14, and it'll continue in 15, is saying to, to take it serious. You know, that, that being a Christian is, is a big deal, that you were a sinner and that you were saved by grace and that God has given you the ability not only to, to enjoy him forever in eternity, but that he, he gives you this abundant or this, this wonderful life that we can be content in right now. And, and that's a big deal. And not to just kind of play church or I'm going to be a Christian on Sundays and Wednesdays and when I'm around my Christian friends, but like everything that you do, it's this huge life change, you know, that God has given you a, a new heart and a new spirit. And he calls us to, to not think the way that the world does, as he talks about in, in, in Romans, but to, to be this new creation, right? To live this new life and to, to take it very seriously. And so in verse 14, when he says, keep this command, you know, to live the Christian life, without spot or blame, again, that, that may not necessarily imply being perfect, but always giving your best effort. You know, if, if you're shooting for 100% and you end up at 92%, you're still in pretty good shape. But if you're shooting uh, for, for a 70, like on a test, and you don't quite make it, well, then you fail. And so praise the Lord that God doesn't necessarily give you a grade or there's not a, uh, you don't get retained in Christianity to be able to fall back into a different grade or anything like that. But understanding that we're giving our best effort. And I, and I really encourage you to give your best effort in every single thing that you do, uh, whether it's a really big, important thing or even something really, really small. Because again, in the sight of God, who, who sees everything and gives life to everything, everything that you do, for better or worse, is laid before God. And we talk about um, in, in other places where, you know, even Christians face judgment at the end time to say basically what, what they've done with the name of Jesus. And so we want to take that seriously. Um, but not in the sense of a legalistic way or, or being terrified about that, but just, just to take it seriously. So in the same way that, you know, if, if you're watching this and you have kiddos, you know, your kids are always watching you and you need to be very careful about uh, words that you say, um, things that you say are okay, things that you engage in uh, because someone else is, is watching you. Now your, your kids are not God, obviously, but the, the fact that your behavior, that your choice of activities, that your language, um, how you treat people um, is evident before other people and it influences other people, um, but it also is evident before God. And so just, just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, um, the next time that maybe you're tempted to say or do something that, that's not God honoring, um, to know that 
for better or worse, God is going to see all the things that we need to do. So we need to take that seriously. Um, will we make a mistake? Probably at some point, I, I'd love you, but you're probably not perfect. And I'm not perfect. And you, you're going to mess up at least once or twice before you pass. Uh, but the point is, is that your goal is to be without spot or blame, to always do your best so that when you slip up, that's definitely the exception and not the rule. You don't want to be known as someone who always messes up and every once in a while you do something right according to the Bible. Um, you'd rather be known not just by others, but known by God as someone who does right before the Lord and lives a godly life. And that's uh, characterized by very infrequent times when, when we don't make the best choice, right? So again, just, just not being perfect, but always putting forth your best effort. And that will keep you out of so many bad situations, guys. Uh, but he's not done. So verse 15, um, which God will bring about in his own time. He's talking about the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the second coming of Christ, um, that he's going to bring about in his own time. So no, nobody knows uh, when Christ is coming again. Um, not to freak you out, but it could happen right now or right now, or right now, or in 20 minutes, or in 300 years. No one knows, right? And so the fact of like, because you don't know when that's happening, to, to get rid of things in your life now that you know are wrong, uh, because you don't know when Christ is going to come back. Uh, so many people that, that hear the gospel and they say, oh, well, I'll just, I'll wait till I get older, or I'll, I'll wait till I, I'll go have a lot of fun, and then I'll ask for repentance. Um, but we all know that the Bible says that tomorrow is promised to nobody. So you don't know how much time, again, not, not, to, not to freak you out or make you paranoid, especially during, you know, COVID-19, but you really don't know um, what is in store for you uh, later this day or the next day or moving forward. And so Paul is discharging Timothy and also us as Christians to basically to get our stuff straight right now and that there's no real good excuse to say like, well, I'm going to wait. You know, you know, again, kind of going back to people that are um, on their deathbed or they're approaching, um, kind of the end of their life. No one has ever said like, man, you know what? I really should have spent less time in the word of God. I should have spent less time with God. I should have done more of my own fun things. No, everybody always says, you know, I should have, um, I should have gotten right with God earlier. You know, I should have treated my family better. And all these things that, you know, if you were to think about it, if, if you were kind of like to pretend again, not, not to be morbid, but if you were pretending like, well, what if someone told you like you were going to pass very soon, what would you get straight in your life? And I would encourage you to get that stuff straight now, whether you're facing a terminal disease or not. Um, it's just, it's the only logical thing to do because we know um, that Christ is coming again. And so we want to be able to stand without spot or blame before him. Again, not perfect, but doing much more right than we do wrong. And again, just, just for anybody who may not be familiar with it, our, our salvation is not bought or maintained by our good works. But we know that as Christians, we, we have a thankful heart and we're so appreciative of, of the, the awesome supernatural thing that God has done for us, that we want to give him our best. We want to live our life for him. We want to live under his rule and his reign and not our own. And so that, that just means being a good Christian, okay? Doing, doing what is right by the word of the Lord. So which God will bring about in his own time, the blessed and only ruler and the king of kings and Lord of lords, 16, who alone is immortal and lives in an unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. And we've referenced this before, but there's some times where Paul's writing a letter and he just like busts into praise because he's thinking about how great God is and he can't help but give God some praise in verses 15 and 16. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing in your own Christian life. You know, when, when you're reflecting about how awesome God is and going back to verse six of the same chapter, you know, being content in what God has given you and just being thankful for how much God has blessed you. Um, and, and just saying, man, thank you, God. You're so awesome. This is so fantastic. It's, I, I know there's COVID-19 outside, but it's, it's a beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that I, I woke up today. There's some people who didn't wake up today. And just to have this, this life of praise and thankfulness to God, where even in the middle of, of your prayer or in the middle of your conversation with somebody or in the middle of driving to work or helping your kids with homework, you can just kind of bust into spontaneous praise because your heart is so full of all the good things that God has done and how good God has been to you. And, and when we're able to reflect that back to him and, and give him praise for that, um, that, that's a beautiful thing. And it's not just for people on the praise team. Um, that's for every single Christian. Uh, verse 17. Yeah, we got time to finish this, guys. Uh, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age, he's talking about finances, right? Literally rich, uh, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. 
So if we went back to our last um, episode in verse 10, he says, hey, there's some people who love money and they're so focused on money and it causes all these problems. Uh, but then in verse 17, he says, there's people who are rich, who have a lot of money, who don't love money. They're not mastered by money. That's not their God. That's not their forefront. Um, but he's reminding even these, these Christians who, who do have money and may have been, been blessed like that, right? Um, you, you may have very little in your bank account or you may have a lot in your bank account. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that one is a good Christian and one isn't. Um, there's just people that make more money than someone else. Just have a different calling or maybe they've been a little better with their money. But what's important about this verse is that Paul is telling Timothy, there's some Christians who, who are rich, who have, have money, right? It doesn't mean they'll have mansions and 45 cars, but they have more than food or clothing that they've talked about in the previous verses, and, and the Bible would consider them rich. In this present world, I'm going to tell them not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, right? So just because you got it now doesn't mean that you're always going to have it. In the last episode, we talked about different seasons in our life. And there's some seasons where there's plenty and you have extra financially. And then there's some seasons where, you know, like you don't eat steak every day. Like it's not, it's not fancy. And so to not put your hope in that, because that's so uncertain, you know, especially during this, this pandemic, you, you may have seen um, different accounts or different investments go way, way down. And so you can't put your hope in, in a bank account or a retirement fund or anything like that, because there's, there's no guarantee that that stuff will or won't be there. Uh, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Whatever you have today, right now, uh, in your hands, whether it's a lot or a little, God is the one who gave you that, okay? And we can never, ever forget that, that whatever you have, it's because everything, first and foremost, belongs to God, and he has chosen to bless you with whatever is in your, your stewardship. So we need to steward that well, right? And so the, the things that you have, and if, if the Lord is providing you from providing for you during COVID-19, um, we can be like Paul up in these verses 15 and 16 and just break into praise and say, man, so awesome, Lord, that, that I, still, um, I still have a job or I still have some lower hours at work or I had some money saved up or whatever it is, and that God is the one who richly provides that. What I really want to po point out is the end of that verse. Everything for our enjoyment, that God has richly blessed you and I with lots of things, and we're supposed to enjoy those things. We're never supposed to enjoy those things more than we enjoy him, but it would be very disrespectful for God to bless us with something and then us not enjoy it, right? It would be like getting a Christmas present from somebody and saying, oh, thanks, but then never using, never using that thing or, or appreciating that thing. You would always appreciate the person who gave you that gift more than the thing, hopefully, right? Um, but to enjoy what God has given you. And so if, if God has given you friends and family, and enjoy them. If God has given you um, a hobby or, or you have some type of thing that you like to do that, that's biblically um, okay, enjoy that. You know, if, if, even if you're not an outdoorsy, outdoorsy person, uh, in, enjoy the beautiful world that God has made. I know where humanity is messing it up with pollution and all this other different stuff, but and there, there's times where you just, you know, you see pictures or you walk around your neighborhood or you go on a vacation and you just, you just enjoy what the Lord has given you. And so I really want to encourage you that even in these dark times, uh, when people seem to be so down and out, and I, I understand why, but that we can have joy because everything that we have has been richly provided by God for us to enjoy. And so I, I've, I've heard um, a lot of really awesome testimonies about families really drawing closer together during this time, or maybe they used to just put their kids on the iPad all the time, or they were always so busy and they never spent time with their spouse or their children or anything like that. And, and this, this COVID-19 time is forcing people to enjoy the things that God has richly provided us with. And so I just want to encourage you um, to have joy in your life. You know, and that's only going to come from verse six, where we're content in God. And you just, you're, you're so blessed by the things that you have, that you just can't help but have a, a big goofy smile on your face and say, thank you, Lord, for the things that, that you have given to us. To have joy in your life. Uh, verse 18, command them. So again, these are still people who are uh, may, may be a little bit better off financially. They'd be rich in this world uh, compared to some other folks. Command them to do good, to be rich, not just in money, but in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. So commanding them to do good, that obviously would line up with what Paul has been telling Timothy this whole time throughout all six chapters about not just doing good works, uh, just to say you've done things, but, but doing things that God has commanded us to do with the right heart. And so he said, 
I, I don't care so much about how much money you have, but I'd rather you be rich in good deeds, which is really encouraging uh, because if you don't meet criteria for verse 17, if you ain't got a lot of cash, that's cool. You can be rich in good deeds. Um, deeds don't have to cost money. You can smile at somebody. You can tell someone you appreciate them. You can be one of those verbally encouraging people. Um, once restrictions are off, you can spend time with people. You can do lots of different things um, that line up with what the word of God says. And th those are good deeds. So whether, whether you got money like that or not, you can be rich in good deeds. And that should be the goal of all of us because remember, wealth is so uncertain in 17, right? But we can be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. So in a very practical command, um, if you have extra money and God calls you to share that, your richness in finances, you can be rich in good deeds um, by being generous and being willing to share. Um, I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to have some different people in different seasons of my life um, that were very generous and willing to share. And I don't mean just money-wise. I mean, there's people that have, have helped us out um, and help me out personally, not just financially, but also um, emotionally. And it's just been there to, to spend time and, and to pray and, and to help and, and really kind of come alongside me to bear those burdens with me and, and, and our family to other people as well. Uh, but being able to be generous and sharing whatever God has given you, if, if it's not money, um, if, if God has given you a talent or a skill or brought you in, brought you in somebody's path, to really be generous, to reach out to that person, to share um, to encourage them and, and just to, to be a support, to be a brother or sister in Christ to that person. Um, that's more important to Paul than how much money they have in their account because money can be a trap or a temptation, can cause us to be arrogant, have a false sense of security. Um, but Paul says, hey, whether you got a lot of money or not, be rich in good deeds and being willing to be generous and share. Verse 19, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly theirs. And so what that's talking about is just having this lifestyle that, that lines up with all the biblical mandates in the Bible. Um, to understand that, you know, what if, you're, if you and I are living our lives in accordance with the Bible, we're doing things to draw closer to God, just as an individual. And we're also doing things to be able to draw other people closer to God as, as an individual and then as a community or as a family. Uh, whether that's blood related or a church church blood related family right under the blood of Jesus to be able to do these good deeds in verse 18 lay a much stronger and a firmer foundation than whether you just have a lot of money or you keep to yourself uh, but being rich in good deeds uh, verse 20 calls them by name Timothy guard what has been entrusted to your care Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely caused knowledge, what is falsely called knowledge, excuse me. So uh, calls them by name, which is, is very endearing. Um, guard what has been entrusted to your care. So like we've talked about, um, that's a few episodes ago, where whatever gifting or talent, uh, whatever God has given you to use that for the glory of his kingdom, uh, to guard that that has been given to you, to be able to use your gifts and talents first and foremost for the Lord, then for your family, and then for other people around you. Uh, but to, again, that, that theme of taking this seriously, and don't just be flaunting this or using this all over the place, that it should be used um, in a way that, that lines up with the word of God. And so just straight up tells him, turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. So all this stuff that he's really been talking about all throughout this book, he tells Timothy, man, just, just stay away from that stuff. That doesn't mean like, you're having a conversation, someone starts talking crazy, and you like literally run away from them. He's just saying, don't, don't, don't be a part of that. Don't, don't feed into that. Don't consider those things. Don't let that, those negative things permeate your mind and your heart, because he said it's falsely called knowledge. Um, and the last verse says, which some have professed, and in doing so, have departed from the faith. So again, it's this it's this false knowledge. It's this unsound doctrine. It's this, it's this bad theology that's pulling people away from their faith. And so not only Timothy as, as a leader, as a pastor in Ephesus, um, but just, just as a Christian man. So for me as a Christian man and, and you watching this man or woman, you know, really, really being, really being focused on what the word of God says and then living in that. And so that, that's really my, my goal is, as Paul finishes this to say, uh, grace be with you all, kind of an abrupt letter, um, abrupt ending to this letter, um, but Paul has been focused over and over and over on having sound doctrine. And, and so that's why we do this style of Bible study 
Uh, we do other styles of Bible study and under different circumstances, but um, in addition to this, right, like not in place of this, but just really focusing on having that sound doctrine. And, and just to be honest, like if you're not opening your word and you're not, you're not reading, you can't do what you don't know, right? Like if someone were to, were to tell you, hey, um, I want you to go, um, to go be a nuclear physicist. You'd be like, well, unless that's your calling, like you have no idea how to do that, right? So you definitely wouldn't just wing that or try to figure it out or push different buttons when you're at the, at the nuclear reactor, right? But in, in the same way, you know, you, you and I cannot live a Christian life in line with the word of God if we don't read the word of God. And so again, just as we, as we kind of close out, um, just kind of looking back at this, I really encourage you. I know we go at a really slow pace and I think that's helpful for me and, and hopefully it's helpful for you as well. Um, go at a slower pace. But what's really cool after you finish doing this like very slow, deliberate type of study, um, it's really neat to go back and then read through the whole book at a much faster pace because everything is going to come back to memory, that God's going to recall those things to your memory that they talked about and that you prayed about. And that um, it just, it makes so much more sense when you're reading through it again, maybe a little more quickly um, after you've, you've gotten down through the nuts and bolts and gotten down to it. But again, really focusing on sound doctrine. We talked about public worship and church leadership. Um, big one that we spent the last half really talking about is our personal discipline and just being a caring church, like being, just being a good Christian, right? And so I really appreciate you guys um, who have watched uh, most of, if not all of these episodes. Uh, we're going to be continuing these. Um, on a different topic. It'll be a, su a surprise announcement. I'm praying about some stuff, but I want to make sure it's exactly what God wants me to do. Uh, but we just want to pray um, in totality about First Timothy. So if you guys would join me in that, I would really appreciate that. God, we just thank you for the truth of your word. Um, we, Lord, we thank you for the things that you put in Paul's heart to write to Timothy. And even though they were specifically to him, um, there's so many things that we can glean today as a Christian. And so God, I just pray that, that we would be focused on sound doctrine, Lord, or that we would know what you say about yourself and that we would, we would submit ourselves to do those things. It's not up to us to try to figure it out on our own, God, um, or to try to be fancy or try to argue or convince other people. It's, it's up to us to submit ourselves and humble ourselves under your lordship that's displayed in your word. So God, I just pray you would help us to be, um, whether we have a, a ministry title or not, Lord, to be a good leader, to be a good Christian, uh, to be devoted to you, Lord and to just persevere as we read in a couple of different places, God, and be focused on what sound doctrine is, Lord. Father, and I pray for those who maybe have not been used to uh, this type of Bible study, Lord, that you would encourage them to continue in that. Uh, whether it's in these videos or they do it on their own or in another avenue or another church, Lord, that's fine. But what's important is that they're opening your word and they're hearing from you and that they're putting it into practice. And they're not just doing it in a, in a guiltful way, Lord, but they're doing it out of love and thankfulness, God. So Father, I just pray you would give us a desire a love for your word, and that you would empower us to, to live it out by your spirit, God. And we just thank you so much, Lord. You're so good to us. Help us to fall into spontaneous praise and just say thank you for how good you are. Even if things are still rough around us, and we can still praise you, and you are still worthy of praise. So Father, we thank you, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time.